nobody sells the home if they don't want to sell their home and there isn't a need, want, and desire to do so. So we got to start with the outcome in mind. Hello, welcome to episode 202 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by the king of objection handling and founder of the Objection Box, Bill Walsh. Helping entrepreneurs scale their businesses to achieve financial freedom, Bill focuses on attacking common objections by identifying what he calls the North Star of a sale. Throughout our conversation, Bill shares how to communicate with leads to determine what the North Star is, how to get past smoke screens in order to address true objections, and why preparation and confidence play such an important role in overcoming those objections. But before we get on to today's featured interview, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents Podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. And finally, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to our conversation with Bill Walsh. Be sure to check out the episode description for links to the Objection Box community and Bill's social media profiles. Really, the way I'd like to start everything out is if you could introduce yourself to us a little bit. Uh, first of all, where you're at and a bit about your sales background. Yep, no problem whatsoever. Firstly, uh, a big thank you, Michael, uh, for sharing your platform. I definitely appreciate it. So thank you very much for doing that. My name is Bill Welch, and I am in sunny London here in the UK. Uh, and you can probably hear that thick Irish accent, uh, which is not a UK accent right. for all of you Yankee doodle doos, as I call you guys over there on the other side of the pond. Uh, so I, I grew up in Ireland, but I've lived in the uh, UK for the last 10 years. That's where I'm at. Right. So how did you... Um you know, and we're really going to be getting, diving into objection handling and your tips for closing more sales. But tell me yeah. a little bit about your sales background. How did you get into it? Yeah, great question. So for me, it, was, it wasn't it was a case that I just put up my hand and said, oh, my God, there was this great mad industry called high ticket sales. It was more of a case of a need and a want at the time. So I had a baby, Jew, and uh, just kind of fell into my lap more so than anything. A friend of mine had a gym in London here and uh, we were struggling to pay the bills like everybody was. In COVID, I was a personal trainer and I ran gyms. So we kind of fell into sales and uh, I was selling push-up sit-ups and sit-ups or push-up jumping jacks and sit-ups, I should say. And uh, I ended up selling more and making more selling it than I was doing it. And then the penny hit, Michael, and I was like, went to my partner and I said, I think we're doing it all wrong. I think I can help way more people selling fitness than actually doing fitness with them. So that's when the penny dropped and the rest is kind of history. Then started full time in January 2021. And uh, by March 2021, I was running a sales development company now that does a tremendous amount of revenue and helps a tremendous amount of people. And then set up the objection box in June 6th, 2022. So just crossed two years there last week. It's been a mad ride. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. And like you said, you know, you didn't put your hand up and say, I want to get into sales. And I really think, you know, I, I can count on my hand. I've done about a, I've done a little more than 200 interviews. And I think I can count on yeah. one hand, the amount of people that, uh, you know, their first career choice was real estate or, you know, sales. It's something that you kind of evolve into usually. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think like a larger part, part of my life has always been you know elevating itself to sales so we have a pub in ireland we've had it for over 50 60 years in our family and from the age of two three i've been able to have conversations with people and you know connect with people I spent a lot of years in military a lot of years in personal training coaching leading training uh, individuals personally or whether a team so a lot of the stuff then i played a lot of high level sport Mm -hmm. uh, take care of myself physically as well. So everything Michael kind of lent itself into co coaching and training and developing people. So sales was a very natural progression for me and with all of that behind me as such. Right. Absolutely. And like I said, you know, our, uh, our audience base is, is real estate agents and brokers and uh, objection handling is something they do every single day. And that's really yeah. the main topic I want to talk to you about. And so how did you, when you were, uh, you know, starting your sales journey, uh, how did you find yourself to be really good at handling these objections and, and closing yeah. these deals? <laughs> yeah. When I started, uh, 
I started in fitness and then I went into selling sales people, sales training. So sales people, sales training, uh, the hardest people to sell because most people live in fantasy land. Most people live on confidence and operate on a place of fake uh, conviction in themselves. So to tell a salesperson that everything you've done up to this point is leaning itself into, you know, you not achieving the goals that you have for yourself, your family, and your future wasn't a whole lot of what people wanted to hear back then. Uh, so I got to get, I got, I had, and I did get very good very quickly because there was pressure. I had to feed my family. I had to keep a job and I had to produce. So it's like everything. If your back's against the wall, there's only two things you can do, Michael. You can come out swinging or you can fall down. That's how it goes. And more often than not, I come out swinging. So it was more of a, a need, want, and desire uh, in order to get better because I wanted to produce and I wanted to be the guy. That's why. Right. Absolutely. And I was I was watching um, uh, your video that you provide for free, the uh, the YouTube video. And I one of the things I was really interested in that and I want to dive into is, you know, what real objections are versus those smoke screens. And I thought that yeah. was a really interesting concept because sure. the two smoke screens, I feel like in real estate, uh, people feel like are major objections. Sure. Well, the two biggest smoke screens in most markets are think about it and a partner. Um, when you say that to people, people are like, what do you mean by that? And I mean, like when you go away and think about it, what is coming off you that makes you want to think about it? More often than not, it's going to be money, fear, or logistics, or they're going to use another smoke screen, which is your partner. So even when you speak to your partner, you don't go and speak to your partner about tin air, Michael. What do you go and speak to her about? You speak to her about the finances, the logistics, the time, the energy that it's going to take away from you, what you need to give it, and all of the other stuff. So the smoke screens and a concept of what I'm talking about are a barrier to the actual objection. Yeah. So they're a two-step process. So when you hear a smoke screen, which is a think about it, or a partner, or like, can you write this into me an email? Can I call you back next week? Can you send me over the PDF? Uh, my wife is just going away with the car. All of this stuff is just a block between actually what is coming up and what the big problem is. That's what the smoke screen is. Right. And then so when you are, uh, you know, whether it's a real estate agent, you know, at a listing appointment, you know, meeting with somebody for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, going over, you know, whether or not they, you know, want to use your services or, you know, you're uh, selling fitness equipment. Yeah. Um, I, when you're in that conversation, how do you start, you know, kind of getting past those smoke screens and kind of, you know, leading the conversations to actually get to those real objections? Give me the smoke screen and I'll tell you and I'll give it to you now. And most people well, won't do that, Michael. That's important. Yeah. You know? Most people won't go on the spot. Um, but it's, it's, it's a skill set. It's a management of obviously the words and it's a filtering process. So I, I turn it upside down. So if you can imagine a triangle, top of the triangle is obviously the, the spear. Flip it upside down, and that's what your objections are. So on the front is obviously the wide. The widest gap is obviously the biggest smoke screen. And as you filter it down, you get to the real objection, and that's where the money is made at the end. It's obviously helping people you know, transition into what they want to do uh, rather than what you want them to do. And that's the key to objection handling. It's like you sell with integrity and you sell with purpose, but you sell because you're there to help. A lot of people don't like salespeople, and a lot of people have this misconception of we're bad people, but we're not. If we were bad people, we would have been snubbed out 150 years ago. So salespeople are an essential part of business. They're an essential part of life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, especially in the real estate game, uh, you know, providing that value and showing that you're really there to help, uh, yeah. you know, your client is, is such a big part of the industry because, um, you know, obviously over here in the States, you know, there's, there's so many different, um, regulations and laws and, and changing laws, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, with, with real estate and, uh, you know, what's being portrayed in the media maybe isn't necessarily, you know, accurate, but that's what people are hearing. So it's, you know, making that negative view of real estate agents more and more. Yeah. Uh, and so having those real, you know, conversations where even if your your sole first conversation is there to provide value, I think that's yeah. a great way to open up the door. Yeah, yeah. Well, like we're there to help. You know, most people think that we're just there to make money. We're not. We can't. People have this misconception that like we're there just to make money. No, we're there to help. And in order to help, we need to actually provide a service and value. And if people feel that service and value is worthy, they will pay you. They can't pay you with skin. They can't pay you with blood. And they're not going to pay you with diamonds or gems. They're going to pay you with hard-earned cash. And that's what it is. That's the game. That's the transition of value. Yeah. When you are, um, 
you know, working with a client, how, how much, how important is it to, um, you know, kind of do your homework as much as you can on them, uh, ver- you know, and then also the specific market conditions or, or whatever they are in the, in the, um, you know, market to purchase. Yeah. Uh, so you have all that information to provide to them on the front end. Yeah. I think, uh, I think your skills are very important and it's like this. Look, if you are rock solid and you are excellent at what you do, it doesn't matter what your Facebook, because you, you train for all, uh, obstacles and you train for everything, you know, and that's how you become excellent at everything because you are preempting everything, you know, and that's how people need to look at it. I always say there's three things you should have, Michael, in your life. There's three things you should do in order to separate yourself. You should outlearn, you should outwork, and you should outlast everybody. If you do that on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, consistent basis, you win the game of everything that you want to do, you know, and that's our motto. Yeah. When you are, um, you know, for these, uh, you know, kind of moving, it, you know, to dealing with the actual objections and not necessarily the smoke screens when it comes yeah. to, you know, uh, the, you know, money is always one of the big things when it's, you know, yeah. purchasing a home or even, you know, selling a home, you know, yeah. you might have an inflated value of what your home is and, and you yeah. think that it should be listed at a higher price. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what are some of your tips for handling those in a way that isn't coming across as look, I just want to get it listed for a price that's going to get it sold as fast mm-hmm. as possible. It might not be what you want, yep. but you know, how do you, how do you kind of not necessarily sugarcoat it, but help lead people down that, that path to, you know, a decision. Yeah. It's, it's, you have to, you have to make decisions based on the outcome in play. So why would somebody want to sell their home, Michael? Mm-hmm. Why would they want to sell it? What do you think? Well, I mean, in a lot of cases, there's, you know, a, a need to, maybe there's a, a lifestyle change or, or, you know, a, a move, well, a divorce, all kinds of different things. A divorce or people got a new job or someone has sadly passed away and we need to downsize, whatever it may be. So nobody sells the home if they don't want to sell their home and there isn't a need, want, and desire to do so. So we got to start with the outcome in mind. So we call that my sales industry and in my world and in how I train people, we call that the North Star. So we have to sell based off the North Star and we have to give people the fundamentals of what they're there for meaning their desired outcome. So for argument's sake, if we're trying to, let's say my wife is six months pregnant and I'm trying to sell a home because we want to upscale and we want to, you know, have another bedroom. What's more important, keeping the property on the market for six months, eight months, or dropping it down by 20K and leaving it go in the next 40 days, you know? So it's like, it's making it make sense. I always tell people how you objection handle and how you get people out of their own way is you got to take their information. You got to take what they're saying. You got to change the perspective of what they're thinking. And you got to change their worldview based on my new perception of what the value is. So that is just a simple hook and analogy of basically making it make sense. What's more important to you? Keeping the property on the market for the next six, eight, 12 months, hoping that it sells, dropping it down 20K, getting it competitive, and hopefully selling it over the next 40 days. Bearing in mind that your wife is six months pregnant, what do you think she wants as the best solution right here, right now? Do you think she wants her market or her house on the market when she's getting ready to have a baby without any room to bring the baby back to? Or do you think losing, in theory, is what you're saying, bunny years, or dropping down 20K, actually getting the house moving, and you've been able to go and start your life in another property and building and welcoming your new son or daughter into that family. What do you think is going to be the most important thing for you guys? Right. Absolutely. How many yeah. people would, how many people will go the other way and say, nah, I'm going to go get my <laughs> wife I'm six months pregnant. Uh, 20 K is like, it's going to break us. Right. So yeah. it's just changing the perspective of what the people see and how they feel and actually making it make sense. Yeah. And I really like what you, you know, the North Star analogy. And I think, you know, uh, for being able to, t- to determine what that North Star is, it, it really, a lot of it is, is listening to what your, you know, what that leads or what that prospective client, like what their, what their situation is. If you're not really paying attention to what their needs are, it's really hard to determine what that North Star yeah, yeah. is. But it's also the questions you ask. So the questions we would ask at the front of the conversation to get the true North Star is, Michael, I appreciate you bringing me out here today. Can I ask, I know you want to sell your home, um, but what is the outcome you're looking to achieve here? Yes, you want to sell it for as much money as you possibly can make, 
but what are you doing it for? Could I ask? Like, what's the specification of that? And now what's that going to do? So if I ask, what's your goal here today? You're going to like, in the sense of what? Like, there's 55 different goals. But if I ask a very specific question at the very front of the conversation, it doesn't leave a whole lot of deviation or a whole lot of room for that person to tell you their life story. They're going to say, well, we need to sell our home because grandma's passed away and we don't need seven other bedrooms or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But they're going to give you the reason why. And then it's a case of, okay, so if you need to move your house over the next three months because your wife is six months pregnant, what were you wanting to get out of this in terms of a dollar amount? What we we need to clear 700. Okay. So if we put it off for 715 and we bring it at 710, would you be happy with that amount? We wouldn't be happy. We'll be okay. Well, if I can sell it before your wife gives birth to your new baby, would that make you happy? So, so like, it's just about managing and then it's just about making the expectations, you know, not crazy. That's how I would sell houses. And I've never sold houses, right. stuff like that, but I know how to, because right. it's all based on people. It's all based on their ideas and their goals and their aspirations. Right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, even that line of questioning and starting out the conversation with that line of questioning, I think sometimes salespeople, and I'm sure you I have to imagine the people that you've coached, you mm. know, maybe are hesitant to start their conversations, you know, you know, without, you know, seeing it in action themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, so what are some of your, your tips or how do you coach people to, to get people past those hesitations to really, you know, dive in and, and yeah. start getting people aligned? Yeah. It's, um, it's such a great question. And it's, 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 it, it transfers over into sales is one of those industries where you need very little entry points. And what tends to happen with that is you find a lot of people in there just to make money. And you find a lot of people in there that are running away from something. And when you're running away from something, you're not looking to invest in something. You're looking to find something. And what I say to people all the time is if you want to be the, the world's best and you want to make most of the lion's share of the money in any industry, guess what you've got to do compared to everybody else? You've got to train, you've got to learn, you've got to develop, and you've got to pour into it day, night, weekend, and consistency on top. Yeah. And a lot of people in sales don't do that. And a lot of people in sales don't invest in themselves. A lot of people in sales don't even invest in their own physical appearance. And it's it's like damaging because if you don't bring an operator as a place of confidence, certainty, and conviction, then you're never going to allow your prospects to feel that. So my biggest tip for all of the people out there is you've got to take care of yourself mentally, physically, financially, spiritually, and emotionally. You know, and financially is the big thing because if the finances don't work, nothing works. There's no point being the fittest person in the grave. So you need to make sure um, that your finances are there to support you guys. And of course, uh, you know, the most important thing is your physical health and your mental health for sure. But I tell you this, your physical and mental health will only be backed up if you're financially secure. So that's really important. You've got to invest in yourself. A lot of people don't invest in themselves. It's the biggest thing that they have. And that's not me coming on here and saying that you've got to invest in my coaching. You've got to invest in this. But I mean, like even invest in books, invest in, you know, a podcast, invest in, you know, free YouTube channels, invest in, you know, going to the gym. You know, once you start seeing yourself in a better vo- in, in a better light and, you know, giving it a better light, you know, um, that's when you're going to look to make more advancements in life. Yeah. And I think that's so important for real estate agents to hear because, you know, in real estate, you get your license and it's all based on the laws and the contracts. There's nothing in there about, you know, the selling. You you can go hang your, your license at a brokerage and have zero skills or training on actually closing a deal or handling these objections. And, you know, it, it really is up to you to do the training and the learning yeah. on your own. Yeah. And if you don't do it, what's the outcome? I always tell people, if you don't do it and you don't take ownership of your situation, you're only going to get what you're get given to. And if you're not happy with what you're given, then it's up to you to make a decision, to make a change. And if you don't make a change, you're just accepting. And that's like, you may as well just go and work on a nine to five. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, yeah, I'm interested, you know, when you got into sales, what, what were you doing? What was, you know, what were your um, inspirations or even, you know, the, the kind of education that you were doing on it? My inspirations were the people that are ahead of me that I wanted to take out. Straight up. I'm a killer, Michael. Straight up. And it's killer be killed, in my word. 
and it is in your world too, whether you like it or not. That's the game. Yeah. Because if you and I are going for a property and I want the property and I got to beat you, then guess what? That's fair game. So my competition where my education, I looked at what they did and I wanted to make it better. I wanted to be better than I am better. You know, so I looked at people that are ahead of me. I looked at people that were doing bigger numbers than me. And I said to myself, if I can get around them and I can learn from them with respect, which is really important, with respect and integrity, um, and we can compete. If you look at any um, great sport or any great people at the top of the game, there's a tremendous amount of respect. There's a tremendous amount of integrity. If you look at even tennis, Roger Federer and Nadal, there's great respect, but they will cut each other open if they have to. It's the same thing with NFL or, you know, the hockey or whatever you guys got on over there. So there's integrity and there's respect. But my biggest education and learning and inspiration was the people that are ahead of me that I didn't want to be ahead of me anymore. And I went to work and I stay working and I stay busy now, today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's, I, that's, my, that's my education. Right. Well, and I really love that the sports analogy there, because when you look at, uh, you know, the people that are at the top, you know, the you know, the top of the top, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, a LeBron James or, uh, you know, a Tom Brady, you know, in football and basketball here, those guys, you know, they have a tremendous respect for the history and for the people that they are chasing in the record books. Yeah. But at the same time, they will cut your throat on the field to get there. Yeah, that's the game. Like I come from high level sports, I come from military, I come from building businesses, I come from uh, competition. You know, I have three young, I've t not three young brothers. I got two, uh, two brothers, you know, I come from Ireland where it's, you know, you got to take care of yourself, you know, in every way, shape or form. So I've been around competition my entire life. I thrive off it. You know, someone asked me the other day, he said, why do you keep doing it? Why do you keep going? You're financially good. I said, because like the Tom Brady stop after two Super Bowls. No, we kept going because it's the competition he chases. It's, it's the game of winning. You know, and most of the time I'm losing. I want people to understand that. Like most of the time I lose, 92% of the time I lose, I'm holding out for the 8%, you know, once a week. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm holding out for, once a week. Right. When, so in your coaching, when you are working with people, um, yeah. what are you doing to help them uh, have that same mindset of, okay, you're, you're going to lose a lot, Yeah. but we are going to up the amount that you are winning. We're going to continue yeah, yeah. to, to grow that, that win column for you. Yeah. When you, um, when you pour into yourself and you produce more and you are more and you learn more, and you actually earn more. The losses are the losses. You can't substitute the losses, but the wins are going to be much bigger. And when you elevate your, like you can sell a property for 200 grand or you can sell a property for 20 million. Do you know what I mean? So what's the difference between the guy that's selling it for 20 and the guy that's selling it for 200 in the back end of Oklahoma or something compared to the, you know, water beach fronts of Miami? What's the difference? It's, it's the same house. People still do the same things in the same house. The only thing that's different is the skill set, is the work rate, is the connections and it's the relationships, you know? So I always say to people like, you know, focus on the wins for sure. That's what we're here for. Um, but celebrate the losses because the losses are important too. You know, the losses for me are, are, are more important than the wins. I get more from losing than I do from winning. I get more from people telling me that I'm not good enough rather than people telling me that I'm great. So I live off that energy. I don't know about you, Mike, but I live in that world. <laughs> that world for me is, is not a good place, but it's the only place that I live. So, um, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. It's like a, not an easy game. It's, it's tough, you know, and that's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I definitely relate to that. My son is a baseball player and okay. we're, we're a very good team and we will go on these long stretches of wins and you kind of see the play, you know, the kids, you know, maybe let off the gas a little bit, but as soon as they get that one loss, they are locked in at the next practice. They know exactly what they need to work on to get yeah. better to then go back and beat that team that beat them last yeah. time. Baseball players are actually brilliant as well, because um, if you strike out, if you actually hit the ball three out of 10 times throughout your career, you're actually considered a Hall of Famer, which is absolutely bonkers. When I saw that stat, I was like, that is wild. That like makes no sense to me, but that's the standard and that's the level playing field that you guys have over there at the top echelon of baseball. And that like means to me exactly what we just talked about. You're going to lose more than you're going to win. But if you sharpen up your losses and you build on your wins, you know, eventually you can become an all-timer. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me about launching um, 
you know, the objection box and yeah. what you, uh, you know, first of all, why you, you launched it and, and what you were, you're hoping to solve for people. Well, I found out very quickly in my sales career, I had a knack for leading. I had a knack for uh, sales. I had an, a knack for objection handling. Objection handling is just fundamentally getting comfortable with four things. Yes, no, fuck you, getting hung up on. That's it. If you get comfortable with those four things happening at the end of a call, pretty much you have a bit of fucking swag and a confidence about you. You can do whatever you like. I have that in abundance, as you can probably hear and see, um, which, which can rub people up the wrong way. And that's fine. That's up to them. Uh, so once I found out, and it's not that I found out, it was just more of a case of it was established. So I started uh, training people in sales after two months of being in sales. It doesn't make sense, Michael, does it? No. You know? <laughs> uh, but I did. And it was a big, it was a case of, um, I just, I find sales easy. Um, whereas most of my life I found quite difficult. School is difficult. Sports has been difficult. Relationships are difficult. Mm. Uh, but sales to me has just always been easy. It's just something in me. I don't know. It's like when you see a puzzle and people are able to solve the puzzle, it's like, how did you do that? It's like, I don't know. I just did it. It's just a natural thing for me. So uh, I was very good at objection handling. I was very good at coaching. I was very good at leading. So once things kind of disintegrated with the company I worked with, um, I said to myself, why don't I build my own, you know? So what gave me the confidence to do it more so than anything was I um, I put out this post to say that I was on the market, that I was looking for my next opportunity. And within, I don't know, 24 hours, I had 12 offers, Michael, to go and build and train and coach different teams and companies and stuff like that and, you know, build out different departments and stuff like that. So I had that kind of in the background. And then it was like... Let me just coach a couple of people here and consolidate and figure out my next step. So we set up the objection box, and uh, in the first in the first week, I think we brought twenty people into it. Then by the f by the end of that first four weeks, I think there was over sixty something people in it, and that was that was the start. But then it was like back then when I said to my partner, I think we have something here. It was the exact same thing. Where I said, look, we have something here. In the first four months, we cleared out a million dollars in revenue. Uh, in cash, sorry. And uh, that was the kind of real start of it then, yeah. Picked up our ClickFunnels award and I think we were the first people to do it in four months. I could be uh, could be totally wrong on that. But the first four months of our business, we collected a million dollars. So um, that was kind of really the launch pad to say, okay, we've got something here and we're going to go for it. So we haven't slowed down since. It's been, it's been a fantastic couple of years. Right. What are the, um, you know, for people that are listening that are interested, what are, what's, you know, what is the cornerstone of the objection box? What do you, what are the real kind of um, main points that you, you yeah. work with your clients there? So for us, I've always based everything off doing the hardest thing first, Michael. So sales and being in sales, the hardest thing in sales is to get deals done. So I start from the bottom and I build up. So I start with objections. I coach, train, and develop all my guys from objections, make sure they're rock solid from the bottom, and then we can build out. So I have four parts to the process. So I have the North Star. I have your idea. Lifestyle is where the person ultimately wants to go. I have the inaction questions, which obviously staying stuck and staying in the position where they're currently at. And then I have the objection handling framework. So once I start at the bottom, I build out your objections, and then I go up through the other parts of the process to make it a little bit more seamless and pro and kind of, you know, speed up that step-by-step um, -step game plan. So the objections are the most important. So the objections then are broken down like this. So the objections that we solve and, pro and, and problem solve for all of our guys, there's not 200, there's not, there's not 50, there's not a thousand fucking objections like all of the other people want to tell you. There's five. Think about it, parent and money, fear and logistics. And fear uh, splits in four ways, okay? So think about it, parent and money, fear and logistics. Those are the five objections. Fear gets split in four ways. You'll never hear anyone ever tell you this, Michael, but I'm going to tell you this. Fear gets split in four ways. It gets split in four ways in a sense of fear of me, you, yesterday, and tomorrow. So there's nine things that we need to solve with all of our prospects and all of our students and all of these people that we coach and train and develop. And it starts with those first nine things. Right. How have you seen, um, you know, over the time that you've worked with people, have you seen, you know, uh, a, their, you know, obviously the main thing is their sales careers change, but also their confidence. Because I think when people have that, you know, they start to get those wins and they, and they are learning these things. It, it just, you know, 
it kind of, it just breeds that, you know, you're walking better, you, you're feeling better about yourself and it, it definitely yeah. translates over into the sales. Yeah. Like if, if you want to be a NASCAR driver, Michael, right? Mm-hmm. Or you want to be an F1 driver, or you want to be a great golfer. Where do you get confidence from? You get confidence from the work you put in. You get mm-hmm. confidence from the skill sets you built. You get confidence from, you know, the effort that you've given it. I've never been confident in my life if I didn't do any work outside of it. So when I was in school, I was absolutely dog shit. Okay. Didn't want to be there. Didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do anything. Rebellious little bastard, as you can probably hear. Um, so when tests came around, how confident do you think I was that I was going to pass the test? Fucking zero. Because I didn't do any work and I wasn't willing to do the work because I didn't give a rats about it. Yeah. But when I wanted to play high level sports, I knew in order to beat somebody, I had to be what? Right. You had, you had to, to be, be better. Right. Yeah, and in order to be better than people, I have to train, I have to develop, I have to build my skill sets, I have to build my body physically in order to take take the tackles. I have to run faster, I have to jump higher, I have to move with more agility. I have to be able to be skilled in the sport that I chose. It's the same thing with sales. It's like I don't I, – I, it batters my eyes to think that people walk into the sales not prepared. So what's the point? You're just hoping then. And, like, I don't want to build my life off hope. You know, so I've always been, that's how you build confidence. Like in order to build confidence, it has to be built off effort and, and sweat equity and labor, as I call it with the guys. You've got to build off labor. You've got to build it off your own, you know, entry into it. You know, if you're putting in, it's going to give you confidence, Yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, you know, uh, just a great you know, way to wrap things up is especially in real estate, you know, you can't walk into a listing presentation if you're not, if you're not prepared, you, you don't have, you know, an arsenal of information and value uh, to provide your. Let me ask you this, Michael, I'll give you, I'll give you an example here, right? So you're talking about walking into a presentation, right? So you imagine I walk into a presentation, I'm in a thousand pound suit, my tie is all the way up, boots are nice and fucking polished. Yeah. I walk in, yeah, good haircut, good beard. I look well. I look the part. I set up my presentation. I'm 10 minutes, uh, five minutes ready, good to go. I've got a water in front of me. I'm locked and loaded. Okay? Now, you compare that to my competition, who's 10 minutes late, walks in with a shirt half tucked in, mustard and ketchup on the shirt from having his hot dog, no tie on, a jacket stringed over his fucking shoulder, carrying his papers and pens all in his hands. What do you think is the important aspect that I'm just showing there? Right. Yeah. Is that that presentation? I mean, you got to present yourself as the. Now, don't get me wrong. The minute I start talking, I could talk absolutely dog shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know there's someone out there going to be like, yeah, but that makes no odds. What a fucking blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get that. But at least the first step is if you're truly confident in yourself and you truly believe you're the world's best, then you should present yourself like that, firstly. And I know people are going to be like, yeah, but like the minute someone talks and X, Y, and Z, you know, you can be thrown together and still be world class. You can, for sure. But you can't be world class unless you're prepared in some capacity. Yeah? Yeah. So that's the important part. It's like what you give it and what you present is ultimately what people are going to feel. You know? It's about the skill sets. You know, that's the most important thing in sales. You know, because you're competing every day. Every day we compete. You're competing with me. I'm competing with you. You know, if we were in the same field, you know, you'd have a pain in your head from looking at me. So, yeah, it's it's difficult. Like, it's it's do or die. That's how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Well, where can people find, uh, you know, if they're interested in your training or interested in, in the content that you're providing, uh, where can people find that to hear more? Yeah, so, like, we got a lot of free content. I don't even want anyone to give me a dollar, to be quite honest, until they're fully, you know, ready to go in any way, shape, or form. And I actually want to earn a tremendous amount of uh, reciprocity from the market and everyone else. I'm writing this, Michael, for the next 30 years. I'm not looking to make money tomorrow. So I want to make sure that I give a tremendous amount of value to people. So I got a free community uh, in my Facebook, and uh, it is actually called The Objection Box Community. Okay, there's a simple plug. And uh, in there, what I also do is I go live three times a week, and I also uh, give people a 10-day challenge. Okay, and it's completely free. I'll help you overcome all of those objections. Think about a parent money for logistics. I'll show you the other four steps of the process. Completely free. I also have a YouTube channel. I think it's 
uh, Bill Welch, I think, or I'm not too sure. Uh, we have our Instagram, Bill Welch Official. So there's lots of free content, lots of free education, lots of training out there for everyone for free. Awesome. And I want you to go and make a ton of money. And all I want you to do is say thanks. That's it. Yeah, awesome. Well, we will definitely, uh, you know, make sure that those links are available for all of our listeners. And I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with us today. I appreciate you. I appreciate it, Michael. And uh, I thank you. And uh, hopefully your audience have got some amount of value. And if you haven't, I do apologize. Uh, I am a bit rash and I'm very marmite, as we say in Ireland and England. It's uh, you either love it or hate it. And hopefully, look, it comes from the right place. And I just want to see everyone make money and take care of their families. You know, and that's the goal. That's the plan for me moving forward. All right. Awesome. Again, I really do appreciate it. Michael, you're a legend. Thank you, buddy. I want to thank Bill for joining us today and remember to check out the private objection box community. I've got a link in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.